creating cosmos out of chaos. Okay, so if there was a celebrity who's dead and who died before Instagram came out, that you could see their Instagram account if Instagram was there, who would that be for you, Heidi? Oh, I would love to see the Instagram of Helena Blavatsky, who wrote The Secret Doctrine. Oh, wow. And what is The Secret Doctrine? So that's a scripture um, of this woman who traveled very, uh, er, like for a woman to travel in, the, I think it was around the 1900s, 1920s, maybe. She traveled into the world, to the Tibet, to India, and she gathered all this knowledge. And she wrote a sort of comprehensive work on what is the universe and how is this cosmos made and um, the human soul. And it has all these teachings. It's based on, on stanzas that she found in, in Tibet and all the, the knowledge that she gathered. And it's, uh, it's really very profound. It starts from the singularity. And first there was nothing. And the whole universe lay asleep in the bosom of Divine Mother. It's all these sentences. Wow. So um, I think she had a really exciting life for a woman at that time to be traveling. My goodness. Um, what, all over the world like that. What, that what, so that would have been great. What year? Like what was her era? So I think she was actually born. So she's, she's Russian. I, I don't know when she was born exactly, but she's one of the first theosophists or uh, the founders of the Theosophical Society. So I'm thinking that this is like end of... Like maybe 1890. I could look it up no, maybe no. before I and, say anything. Like, And so this book that she wrote, I mean, is that something that's yeah. available like for anybody to find right now? Like, can we just order it on? Yeah, I, I think online? actually on Kindle, you can almost get it free because um, Alice Bailey, who did a lot of work on, on theosophy and, and all of this, um, all of this esoteric knowledge, she, she has a fund online as well. It's called Lucy's Trust, and everything is available for free there. So I think Helena Blavatsky actually purchased it on my Kindle once for free. That's it's amazing. Doctrine. That's a good answer. I mean, I was going to say John Lennon or Kurt Cobain. I'd be like, well, she, could you imagine? She was born in, in Ukraine, actually. Oh, wow. Um, she was born in Ukraine. Did you say where? Uh, Dnipro. Oh, no way. Dnipro. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, oh, that's really cool. So who would you choose? In, in 1831, who would you choose? Yes. In 1831, wow. <laughs> who would I choose? Yes. If I could watch. Just anyone in history, if like imagine, and it's so silly of a question, but imagine if they had an Instagram, who would it be? That like to imagine what they would put. Like I think Kurt Cobain, because he'd hate having an Instagram, so he'd be really self-loathing and probably making fun of Everything, the, the digital society. culture as a whole. Mm. And John Lennon would just be posting stuff about peace, and it would be really beautiful, I imagine. I think Alan Watts would be Pictures really in interesting to find. Oh my goodness, Alan Watts is Instagram? Yeah, yeah he would be just be so... I think he would be really funny. He would be one of those like, spiritual humorous uh, Instagram accounts, you know? <laughs> or like making fun of people like that guy. There's this really, really funny Instagram account. Oh my gosh, I wish I could remember his name. Um, oh my God. We'll put him, we'll if, if you need a good laugh, he... I think I sent you some videos, Heidi, before, but he just like, he makes fun of like the whole, you know, the, the neo spiritualism that's, you know, really popular these days of everyone, you know, the, just all mm. the stuff that is beautiful, but at the same time he positions it because there's such an overwhelming amount of it, right? Like you go to Tulum or you go to Nosara where we are, you know, it's like, there's a lot of stuff going on, which is all made with great intention, but mm. it's just hilarious that when he makes fun of it, it's like, you're so right. This is so funny. This is so silly. But um, It's like a GP, GP Sears. Kind of, but that less, means, but yeah, like more. But just a cell phone version. A cell phone version and a little bit less um, he like does, a, political, I guess. JP is a little no, more no, political. He did, yeah, he's a little more. He does like Austin and Austin. Um, like a guy named Austin, who's like the typical Austin, like guy living in Austin. And he'll and be like, yo, man, let's go do some cold plunges and talk about <laughs> Aubrey Marcus. <laughs> like he takes all the like typical. The Austin um, meme and turns the into Austin a Austin memes, yeah. yeah. And then turns into Austin memes. <laughs> I've really told funny. you this already. Like my, my favorite meme is a meme just about that. Like this meme where you have like, okay, beginning of the spiritual journey and you have all the tarot cards and crystals and a whole <laughs> bunch of things that you need on your spiritual journey in your backpack. And then the advanced one is just a cigarette and a coffee. <laughs> just to be able to just sit down and do human again. Just to be human yeah, again. 
I like that. It's funny you mentioned Tibet, though, actually, because I started reading Seven Years in Tibet recently. And so that's kind of sparked this really weird thing in my reality where Tibet mm. continues to come up. So I'm having all these memories of us traveling to Tibet. Tibet yeah. And then you're mentioning this woman who was traveling in Tibet. And then today I saw that the viral um, video that came out with the Dalai Lama. What Did you guys that? see that? No. Oh, my I God. I didn't see it. What? So the Dalai Lama had a bunch of people in Dharamshala come to visit him and he had a child on his lap and it's a very quick snippet and the child is on his lap and he, the Dalai Lama leans in and gives him a kiss. He gives a child the a child kiss, a kiss yeah. and then leans back out and they interact. I didn't listen to it. I just quickly looked at it because I can't figure out how to process through it. And then he sticks out his tongue to the child and tells the child to suck his tongue. What? And so people are going mm. bananas calling him a predator like like there's a whole movement right now i i googled it and what? like every headline Lama? is like condemning it and now his instagram put out a statement and then i saw a bunch of other like like people in support of him trying to say culturally in tibet that like there's something about like using showing people their tongues like historically in tibet was a way of showing that your tongue isn't dyed black which means that you're not of a certain type of being and like but it just turned into this whole like like i just, like Cardi sure b they, like condemned it you know what i mean and like it just got it just got t like immediately blown i i feel like the media's probably blown it out of proportion i bet you there but is people are going bananas well, well i know I mean, it's weird, but I think that I feel but like there's probably like, some deeper meaning to... Well, also, it could just be that he's like 80 something. Yeah, and he's and just, maybe he's he's just made, being funny. Or and I, made a stupid mistake well, or bad judgment. Because he's a human nonetheless, yeah, right? Like yeah. I, I, But people have like taken his life's work and just thrown it inside what? of it like you're a child predator. And I'm just like, it's so interesting how, how, just... how packed tightly everybody is and how wound tightly that one little thing. And hey, there could be a chance that he's part of some secret cabal and he could be a child predator. But the chances of that, I would say, Are to jump right low, to that and yeah. like could be quite low. But it was a disturbing video. And I just, it, the only reason yeah. I bring it up is because it was another thing in Tibet and the Dalai Lama. And I was like, I don't know how to process through that. Like, because I, I have so much love for that mm -hmm. man. And I don't want to join the mob and light the torch. But I also don't want to defend him. I just don't feel like I have a place in the equation, but like watching the whole world react, it becomes real. Like my heart broke a little bit to just see how many people just like literally lit the torch and mm. and and stood at his doorway. Well, what do you think? It's really heartbreaking. I mean, it's really heartbreaking these things as well to me. I don't really, like. I don't know what it is, and I haven't seen it either. But I was recently in India, and I I was doing this this training. It was a Kundalini teacher training. But I took it in this ashram where there uh, was one teacher. His name was Dr. Gaurav Agarwal. I hope I say it well. And he was he's a Vedic astrology teacher. So in India, it's a really ancient art. It's been practiced for a very long time. And they have a lot of uh, predictive methods, but also spiritual spiritual remedies for when a planet is not in good shape. And so you could see really, uh, this really got me thinking because there was this one remedy for example, uh, for Venus, if your Venus, if your relationships are not going well and your Venus is in a bad position in your horoscope, they would give you a list of things that you would be doing mm -hmm. uh, to remedy that. And one of the things would be to go on a Friday, which is the day of Venus, and to give food or to feed the fishes. And I was thinking like, so that was like a traditional thing, right? It's like an old pearl of wisdom, do that. And it's just like a simple remedy. And I was thinking, I grew up in a uh, well, I grew up in the countryside in Belgium, but uh, my mother's side of the family is Roman Catholic, right? And so there was this habit that they had somehow installed of eating fish on Friday. And so they oh, would be yeah. eating fish on Friday, mm. whereas we would be feeding the fish on Friday as a remedy. So it's just like the, the opposite. So with these things that are involving like some kind of visual that we that for us is hard to see because for us it means something else. It makes me think of these traditions and how they have been this sort of like even just like practices that we do that um like for example i talked to you about the vomiting that we did in the training right yeah you should like even that like this is a this is a serious condition that we can have here like bulimia like all these mm -hmm. self-image yes. problems that would cause you to like throw up your food but in india there's a practice where you actually drink salt water and then you drink so much that you have to stick your fingers in your throat or 
that you just automatically vomit. So it's like a conscious vomiting. And that's a practice there. And what know? is that or practice have- used for? Like hey, th- a, a type of, I mean, that's a really intense <laughs> practice. Like what would they be using that type of induced Harsh vomiting practice. for in terms of a yeah, self-healing you way? You got to give a little backstory <laughs> there, Heidi. You got to give a little backstory. You didn't do it in your teacher training? No, I mean, in, my, some- in India when I was there, no, the, I didn't do it. I couldn't do it. But there was a couple of different cleansing um Methods we were using, yeah. like, you know, like the, what is it called? Oh my gosh, it's blanking me. Like the one where you pour water. Neti pots. Neti pots, yeah. yeah. Neti pots were great, this especially when you have a cold. I did that a lot. But anything past that, to be honest, like there's one where you had to stick a thread um, into yeah. your nose and then pull it out of your mm-hmm. mouth. Couldn't do that too far for me. Um, and then obviously there's like the real intense cleansing um, methods and spiritual practices that I know a lot of like... Um, those uh, Nepalese uh, sadhus. sadhus do where it's like you put a rope and you, you swallow the it and then mm-hmm. you pull it out. But again, I think, again, that, that's their traditional cultural ways of cleansing and that's incredible. And I they do it I, every single morning. I know that I give it up to them, but to me, that's just, I, I couldn't pass, I guess, that, that level. For me, the neti pot was more than enough to just kind of find that cleansing. Um, so definitely, I, I never, I never, involved myself in any type of induced vomiting practices um and again i think it's uh, it's interesting that you say culturally because you know in the western society i mean if if you even tried to teach that to students as a yoga teacher people would be like what the yeah. hell you're, you're you're literally promoting like bulimia right now you know well i have uh, to say before you give us the actual your perspective on it anytime i've ever had food poisoning the the resurrection from that of the complete and utter purge and yes then you're dehydrated and when you get back together and you get back on your feet it's like i could see that as some sort of very very harsh practice and is that sort of where this comes from Mm -hmm. because honestly i've like you you just feel like your whole intestine like everything is just like completely gone Mm. and you're you build back up right like it's like it's like a whole like 10 day cleanse into like an eight hour food poisoning or something so is it based on kind of like just like getting everything out obviously it's like a purge of well it's a bit like we judge a fever right when we have a fever or when we have like actually when you're vomiting at a food poisoning it's great there's something in your stomach that shouldn't be there so it's coming out and it's coming out that way the way like the way they explained it to me why we did it and we did it as a group so i was going to pitch it actually <laughs> to you guys because i'm coming to see you very soon like maybe we could do the vomit thing together because in the beginning i was like no <laughs> everybody has a bad relationship with vomiting i think like or at least i didn't have a good relationship with that and it was a hard thing for me to do but then once i did it indeed it felt so freeing and they say actually that there's a lot of stuff that is just stuck to the walls of our stomach and when you drink this salt water and you on an empty stomach, right? So you drink it for, like it's in the morning, it's on an empty stomach, it's clean water just with salt in it. You drink this and you throw this up, you just like so clean after. And what I could really feel is that in my mind, I was so much more clear as mm. well. It was just like like a purge because even when I when when you mentioned the like when you have a food poisoning, right? That's actually it's kind of amazing afterwards how clean you yeah, feel. That's what I mean. It's crazy, right? I mean, we, you're coming very soon to visit, so I'll I'll give it a shot. <laughs> Let's have a induced vomiting party. This sounds great, guys. <laughs> we need to put I, a I disclaimer. Don't, I don't know. I don't know if I'll be joining that party. <laughs> I think I have other plans. <laughs> well, it's harsh practices. I guess it's like it's the next level of the spiritual paradigm oh, as, I guess it, so, as it extrapolates yeah, forward. After breath work. Well, it started with the coaches. The pandemic of life coaches and coaches of life coaches. And then now there was a pandemic of breath workers and coaches for breath workers. I think Heidi's onto something here. Harsh practices. But I'm, I'm intrigued to know because I heard that your India experience was really, really beautiful and extreme. What, like, what did you guys study when you were there? Like, how long were you Who's there you for? you guys? How about we just start well, with, you like, guys why did you go like- to India? the people there (laughs) that you were with i went to india for the same reason that i worked on this podcast with you guys to do the traveling ashram but Mm -hmm. travel towards an ashram i really like to just i think my hobby is studying actually and i just wanted to be in a place where there was a rhythm and a routine and a discipline for a month 
So I took this training because uh, I was able to combine Kundalini, which I had never really studied with, uh, with some Vedic astrology. And so that really worked out well. Um, what, I, what really strikes me about teachers in India is that these people, it's like they give it all immediately. Like, you want a palmistry course now? Yeah, great, we can start now. It's like there's no barrier. They learn something mm. and they can immediately give it. Mm. It's, it's so direct. It's a very particular um, place, India, for that. Mm. It's, it's so instant, That's like right. an Aries, we would say. <laughs> right. That's super cool. Where were you in India? In Rishikesh. I was in Rishikesh in the calmer part of it, near a stream, and there was this beautiful little Shiva temple. And uh, yeah, it was all the things, actually. Like on the 11th day, I got myself a slip disc, like the whole thing. So I did 20 days of the training just in a sphinx position, <laughs> uh, really equating myself with breath work. Uh, um, yeah, that was a, that was an adventure. Was and with there, breath, you can heal anything. Like they're onto something, the breath workers. Oh yeah, no, for I sure. I cured myself with the breath. That's amazing. Wow. And do you feel like, um, just cause I feel like you're one of the, those people in my life that I can come to about any questions when it comes to the stars and the cosmos and what is the meaning of this and that? I, I don't know. I think it's just a natural gift you've been born with. Not that the fact that you've actually studied it as well, but I'm curious to know, like, is there something that they taught you through like the Vedic astrology and the Kundalini that blew your mind? I don't know, like something mystical or something mm -hmm. that connected some sort of dot in your mind. I'm just so intrigued by yeah. that. You know, what's really interesting is that we have, so when we do a bird chart, we take a picture of the sky. The moment you step into this world, the moment you are pushed through the birth canal and have your first breath, right? And that picture of the sky is pretty different here in the West than it is in India, where they use another um, zodiac system. So it's the same zodiac, but over time, things have moved. Mm -hmm. And in the West, we have been pretty rigid mm -hmm. in our minds, and we still apply the system. So it's possible that you are your ascendant sign, which is your rising sign, that you are a Leo rising in the West, but you will be a Cancer rising in, in India, in, in their Vedic system. And that really made me think, because we are the meaning-making machines, right? And I asked my teacher about that, and he said something like, yeah, actually, when things are not going well here in India, for a person, we would draw their Western horoscope so you can look through that lens for a moment. And I thought that was really beautiful because astrology, yes, it's a science and you can calculate things, but then surprisingly, you can also just use it as a way to just completely shift your mind. So I looked at my own astrology chart from that perspective and like things had moved a bit, things were quite different. And it really made me think about the way we make meaning and how important that it is with these healing arts that we come into, into it with a place of integrity and a place of um, like what is best for the person that is sitting in front of me, you know, when I, when I consult. And I thought that was really, that actually blew my mind because we make the meaning and you can also make the meaning, make the meaning with that other chart, which is not that different, but slightly different. Mm. And it is also correct in a way. So there's different realities that, uh, that reveal themselves in that way. Hmm. Are you saying that <clears throat> astrology isn't just under one chart of set of stars that you can take one from the West and one from the East and get different meanings from it? Well, for example, you're a Gemini. I don't think maybe you're born early enough to be a Taurus in a, in, in Vedic astrology, in, in the side, side, like in the sidereal system. So that's, a, that's another way of looking through it. So we look, we look, well, we look through the world in different languages, right? I speak the language of the stars. Mm -hmm. We can speak the language of yoga together. There's mm -hmm. different languages that we have. And that just like gave like a whole other perspective and way of looking at it. Right. And, and there it's a science. So there is really like it works with calculations. It's very precise. It's with predictions and cycles. And it's maybe perhaps a bit more intuitive in the way that I practice it and in the way that I studied it with my teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, although there's a lot to learn as well. But I thought that was really, really interesting that um, it's really something to be understood with your intuitive mind and not with your logical mind. Right, right. 
And because it breaks your mind, right? So I'm a different person when I go to India and like I draw my chart there and then I'm that person, you know? Well, it's interesting. And the I feel, that I was, yeah, I was just me. saying when you mentioned that you're a different person when you go to India, it's like, I think everybody becomes a different person when they go to India slightly, just because of the way India affects your, your psyche. And, you know, it's not, I find that's not the easiest country to to exist in. So it's interesting how. Well, we felt it challenged us in a way and it made us be something we weren't used to being to in order to survive and to thrive. Yes. And and is that what you mean when you say like you're a different person when you go to India? Like that you, the circumstances make you behave differently or do you think you take on a different identity when you're there? Because I think there's also people that enter certain mm -hmm. places take and cultures identity, and then yeah. all of a sudden they start dressing different and talk like, mm -hmm. it's like it's like that the spiritualist identity becomes a little bit more ingrained into the belief system of, of who they present themselves to be. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what, what do you, how did you feel that it changed you that you were so different in India? Oh, this is my second time in India. And I think it strips away. It's actually not a different identity that you become. This was, I, I mentioned this in relationship to the different horoscope that you would have there. I think India, like they call it the digestive system of the world. So it kind of flushes mm. everything out of you that you are not. And um, yeah, I got three, food poisoning three times. <laughs> the jungle I know all about that. that. The, jungle the jungle does, does that, does that too. too. No, yeah. totally. The jungle <laughs> does that too. It's also like a karmic accelerator and, and a sort of initiation. These places that are radically different from what we are used to, mm -hmm. like what our comfort zone is, they always well, kind of show us who we are. Like, Costa Rica also will tell you who you are mm -hmm. in a way, and it will spit you out if you're not ready. So you would heal and come back st stronger. For me, India has always been a place of healing because it immediately gave me, like not immediately, but quite quickly gave me an injury. And I also had that last time. Mm -hmm. so. Interesting. Well, that's, that's interesting because well, you're in Montezuma in Costa Rica and we're here in Nassara yeah. in Costa Rica. And we both, all three of us have spent time in India. So we've been drawn towards it. What do you think it is about these locations? that like that draw like what is it in our in your or our personality or in the stars that brings us to these places of great um challenge challenge yeah. I, like i think um, there's challenge and reward right because they're these places mm -hmm. costa rica and india they challenge you in a different way in terms of more of like that survival way right in india you just have to find a way to survive through the chaos and then okay. In, in Costa Rica, well, where we are here, you have to find a way to surrender the jungle and survive through it because you're just like kind of one with the elements of nature and things don't always go the way you plan and it, it tests you, right? So it's interesting. It's... Well, what is it? Why are yeah. why, like, why us? Do you feel like we're looking for difficulty? <laughs> like we're looking for... Because that brings me back to Saturn. You know, Saturn is the master teacher. So sometimes... I feel like with Costa Rica, if you've driven like a really difficult road and like, your organs are all reorganized and you're really not feeling well after the ride, like, you know, like, because people think paradise and it's kind, it's paradise. It's beautiful. She's generous. She gives everything. But at the same time, there's things that are hard, you know, like mm -hmm. going to the bank is a six hour adventure, like all these things. Every, everything's twice as hard it's in our, Costa Rica. It's our desire to, to evolve, I think, and to to grow and just make it a bit more difficult for ourselves. So sometimes mm -hmm. the most difficult thing is where there is the most breathing room to, to grow. It's like mm -hmm. looking for initiation. Almost. No, I, I, I was, you know, I do my morning pages every, as much as I can almost every single morning. And I think multiple times yeah. since we've come back to Costa Rica, I've found my, cause I just sort of dump into the book. I do at least a page every day. And multiple times, it's interesting to see that I'm releasing all of these thoughts, pr processing through the idea that most of my life has been meant driving towards something that is incredibly difficult or challenging. And when I've mm -hmm. done that is where most of the growth has come to my myself and most of the deep experience that when I come out, I, I come out different and the evolution of my story and of who I am. And it's interesting that, you know, I guess maybe it's the seeker identity, like, or the seeker personality, like we're seeking mm -hmm. something, like we're seeking more out mm -hmm. of life and a deeper and richer experience. And I think maybe it was intuitively at first, but now I feel like I'm almost hungry for more. And we've been talking about like, maybe we should go to the desert in Morocco 
for two weeks. You know, like we're looking, what? or like I, I even said to her the other day, I was like, for my birthday, I want to go on a, a hike in the Rocky Mountains, leave everything behind and just camp and see how long we make it. <laughs> and it's like, it feels like I'm hungry for that now consciously. But before as a kid, I was just like driving towards it unconsciously. But I find that like, that's a commonality to people like us that are like looking for the new dimension of ourselves and to like look through the prism of who we are from a different perspective to mm -hmm. learn more depth. But do you think also that has a lot to do with just our our soul's alignment with the particular locations of the earth? Like I remember Heidi, we we talked about this in Sedona. I remember when we were on tour <laughs> with our, our first uh, recordings of all the po podcast episodes. And there's something you told me that was really interesting that there is a way to also look the charts or, or the planetary alignment mm -hmm. to find like the location that is allowing you as a soul to thrive. Like I find that really fascinating mm -hmm. how there's this correlation between physical locations mm -hmm. on earth mm -hmm. and how they work and align with our soul pretty much or the place that we are in our, in mm -hmm. our journey. I think that's really like a beautiful thing about astrology or, or if you even drop astrology for a moment, you must have places where you come and you're like, oh, wow, I can really feel this. Like I have this in Paris, for example. I spend a lot of my time in Brussels, not in Paris. But when I go to Paris, I feel timelines descend in me. I can remember. And it's mm. just like the soul remembrance and recognition. And I really felt that homecoming as well with, with India in a way and with Costa Rica. And I looked at, obviously, after when I discovered this language of astrology, there's something called uh, astrocartography where you put the planet lines that you, uh, there's lines over a map. Let me just say it like that. You have a moon line, you have a Jupiter line, you have a line for all the planets and the points and how they interconnect. And I realized that there were indeed like lines running through these places. For example, Costa Rica is on my moon line and your moon is your instinctual self. It's your home. It's um, who we are at night when no one is watching. That kind mm. of... Uh, Which line yeah, is that? You, like, the moon line. Self. The moon, moon line? line or the moon, the moon in your chart as well. So in your horoscope where your moon is would be significating that. So I think so it's interesting that there's places that make you feel like, I don't know, maybe there's places that that are maybe strange, but you could come come and uh, be in Patagonia and be like, wow, this is really where I belong. And where does that come from? Right. And it, mm -hmm. it, it feels to me that it's some sort of soul memory, like I've been here before. Right. Do you like, ever have yeah. that in places? Oh, all the time. I mean, I think definitely Costa Rica has been one of those places for us. And this is the reason why we kept coming back for the last 10 years is that you enter an environment. I mean, maybe there's other factors to it, but you just, you feel like you thrive. And we always talk about it. It's like, I feel oh, like I, I yeah. thrive in this place, in this environment because, well, the sunshine and the fresh food and the organic food that is around you and the abundance of nature and animals and wildlife it's just like all of these components they they affect your being right and so you feel a certain way whereas like for example you can tap into that feeling and if you go to a big city like I can't survive big cities like we were in LA for how long a week <laughs> that time and it was already like it, it penetrated my energetic field as like aha like I'm vibrating in a different frequency and I feel like I need to escape and retreat. And it's interesting that when you start to tune into how the external environment feels inside your heart, you can tap into those. It's interesting because what you're saying there, um, there's a nuance, right? Between the circumstance, like as you wrapped it up there, you're saying the circumstances mm -hmm. and the environment and how it feeds you. But what I think what's interesting as well, what Heidi's saying, sometimes there's places that for mm -hmm. some reason in your soul, you feel it. And it's, and, and maybe that translates as well to feeling optimized and thriving. Mm -hmm. yeah. But Costa Rica, I mean, I think it might be the duality of both the circumstances of the, the fresh mm -hmm. air and the clean food yeah. and the energy in the jungle, but also that we probably were drawn to that before. And there's a soul connection to it because we have been fighting to stay here and coming here. I've been coming here for over 15 years. We've been coming here together for 10 wow. years. Mm -hmm. Like, and it, we just keep getting drawback and as many things that try to stop us from coming, mm -hmm. all of the crazy circumstances, yeah. we still thrive here. Mm -hmm. Like the romance may be over, mm -hmm. but we still feel the love. Mm -hmm. And that's a really interesting thing where at the same time, I think we've mm -hmm. been to places like really random places sometimes where it isn't necessarily the environment that makes us thrive. 
but our soul sings to it. Like there were some places just in the desert on it. Like when we were all shooting the first episodes of the podcast, like we found ourselves in Marfa, Marfa, Texas. Yeah. Remember Marfa? And all of a sudden we were all like, there's nothing here to, like there wasn't even good food for us in Marfa, <laughs> but we were like, this place just there's speaks just to our soul. There was like an energy. It was like a vortex, right? And so I think that's really cool. Like it's like, I don't know, like I'm trying to think of other places that speak to the soul, not the circumstance or the environment. And there has to be some because well, like- sure. But I, you know, it's interesting in my mind right now, like the way you were saying, Heidi, that if you draw these lines on the world map mm -hmm. and you see where your moon line is, the sun line, like this is a practice that people can do or, or I guess have somebody do it for them. And do you think that would help people be guided in, through their life in a special way? Like if they were to listen to those lines and how accurate- is that? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it would ask for a very specific person to 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 use that. You know, like I use it in my study because I'm really curious on like, wow, why do I feel or like sometimes, for example, there was a time where I was in Baja California and I could really write and focus. And I was like, why is this? Mm. Oh, yeah, it's on my Mercury line. So it's in a way a sort of astrology that can really help if you're looking to relocate, if you feel like it's not where I need to be. Right? Well, that, so it's I like relocate. That could be really. I I don't think that's specific. I think we get emails and DMs on Instagram and stuff all the time with people that don't feel like that they're where they need to be. So I think it's like but, it may yeah. be specific to but those people, but general. I think it's I think it might be something like you can help people with that, right? Like, can they can can people consult with you to find out their mm -hmm. lines and help? figure out where they run that might give them like the breadcrumbs to follow, to find the place of home that so many people out there just, they're looking at their life and they're like, I'm not happy here, but they don't even know where to begin yeah, or to, where go to go look. or where to search yes. for it. Well, there's two things to that, right? Okay. There's a physical home, but of course, like the first thing that astrology does or soul astrology does is like a homecoming like, to yourself, to who you truly are because eventually location, if we move somewhere to, to escape, you know, like you'll bring yourself, we will bring ourselves and maybe for a while it's different mm -hmm. um, because even Costa Rica, it will not give you a while, you know, no, it's like yeah. a karmic accelerator. So it will give you immediately your shadows. So I think it's also, it's more first about a homecoming to yourself. And then this would be like another step to see like if you really have a specific goal, or you're looking like, would it, how would it be if I moved there? You know, mm -hmm. because I think there's an inner guidance system as well. And um, there's also a general um, malaise about where to live at the moment. We've had Uranus in, in Taurus for, um, for a couple of years now, since 2018, I think, like shaking, this, shaking up the stabilities that we have, the foundations that we have, uh, what, what makes our sense of home and I think like all of these energies play play in, you know, and like there's no quick solution for that, mm -hmm. but just to discover like what's yeah. my soul's desire and why do I not feel at ease in this moment? What is going on in my life? And I think astrology is a beautiful tool to tap into these cycles first and to see like what does the soul desire to do? And then further, of course, the physical things can fall into place um, mm -hmm. in no, the I next think, stage. No, I think that because that's, it's true. I, I love that you said the, the first is coming home to yourself because I always think about that as the departure, like the departure of everything that you've sort of been mm -hmm. sort of pedigreed to be inside of society. And it's not necessarily the truth or authentic, like true self that you yeah. are, but it's like you just kind of bumped around like a pinball through culture and ended up in a job and a role and pl having all these identities. And I think the departure of that to find the truth of it is the, obviously like the most pivotal moment of all of our lives. But I also think that um, that breadcrumbs, like I was saying earlier, breadcrumbs to figure out where is a good place to to nurture that and to cultivate the mm -hmm. truth inside of you because that becomes the journey and it, there's no destination in that in that discovery, in, in self-realization. Like very few people reach the enlightened self um, and finding a place that you're in line with 
I think that's so valuable. It's funny because I, I passed voice messages over Instagram with someone who's asking me these questions. And I was like, I actually said like, first you have to be good with you. Like, don't think that you're going to go somewhere and all of a sudden you're going to feel great about yourself. Well, people think that the external environment is going to bring them happiness and and maybe it will for a very short amount of time. But if you can't find happiness and peace within yourself, then there's no place out there that will be able to provide that for you because in the end you return back to yourself. And if it's not clear in there, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? If there's a lot of shit that you got to, you know, work through, then you could be in paradise or you could be in a tiny little apartment in the city and you're going to experience very similar things. And we've met a lot of miserable people here. (laughs) And that too, when you see it, you're like, wow, there's such a beautiful environment, but but people are, you know, there's some people that are a little kooky, you know, and you're just like, wow, you are very, very um, troubled person. And yeah, I think it's it's interesting that I think a lot a lot of us fall into that feeling though, and I sometimes feel it too. If I'm just feeling like really unaligned and in a bad place, I'm like, oh, okay, I need to leave. Mm-hmm. I need to go here. We just need to pack up our stuff and go to this new environment because I feel like, well, this is going to help me. And you know, it, sometimes that's a great first step. It's though. a first for sure because yeah. it shakes up the environment. But in the end, mm-hmm. whatever I was troubled by, is still there inside, and I have to deal with it one way or another. So escaping from it in terms of the location isn't the complete answer to it. It does help for sure, which is why I always say, like, when people ask for recommendations for yoga retreats or even yoga teacher trainings, which I find it is like yes. a very intense, you know, as you know, you just did one in India. I always recommend people like go somewhere, like remove yourself from the environment of where you live, whether it's your city or just the people around you, because just that extraction mm-hmm. and bringing yourself to a new place will give you a little different perspective to what's really going on inside. And plus, you know, yoga retreat gives you that structure, as you were saying, and, and an ability to focus every single day rather than just car- carving out a couple hours a day. But I always find that, you know, removing yourself from a location, just even for a temporary moment, if you're really looking to to search inside your heart and to figure something out that is bothering you or or a big life change that you need to partake in, you know, mm-hmm. it's it's always important. Um, yeah, but, mm-hmm. no, I feel that. And there's one thing actually you always give me this this sensation uh, Juliana you're right where you need to be actually where you are yeah. then at the same time traveling I think it's one of the transcendental languages that we have you know you can travel far within your mind through meditation and mm. in astrology that's kind of the same that's the same mm. thing like Sagittarian energy or you can travel far and actually see a different culture that will shift your mind mm-hmm. and that will yes. shift your perspective and open your mind because eventually like what I feel like we, what we're after by moving places and coming to places like this, like the jungle or going to India is eventually it's all expansion of consciousness. And that's the purpose of why we're all here. We all share that as a human family. Mm-hmm. And that's why we the soul produced this life. That's and so-, so why are we born at a specific place in a specific family? That's the conditions mirrored at us. What we have, that's the karma that we're working. Mm-hmm. So same place, why am I here now in the jungle? It's that it's here mm-hmm. uh, until I feel like I have to move. And then mm-hmm. then I have to inquire within myself. You know, I think there's a lot of restlessness at the moment as well. Yeah, for yeah, sure. There is. I was going to ask you that, actually, because you see a lot of clients one on one. Do you find that yeah. in the last portion of time, a couple of months, that there's been a lot more people coming to you with that feeling of purposelessness or feeling lost in their mm-hmm. life? I, uh, well, yes and no. Um, it depends, you know, like they, they all have their, I do feel that there's been a huge shift in the last month in March where we had two big planets move signs and uh, Pluto has a generational influence. So that's like a transit that will last for the next 20 years. So we just come out of 18 years of it being in Capricorn and then it moves into Aquarius. So that's a big shift and it happens for everyone somewhere in their birth chart. So they can feel like, whoa, there's a big change. There's something big that is, that is happening. And I, I need to make a radical change because Pluto is like that. It's the planet of the soul. It's a planet of death. So and that that's just something happened? That, that just, happened, that just when? happened last month. So it will be there until somewhere in June. And then it will retrograde slightly to then in 2024, not come out of Aquarius for the next 20 years. So that I can see like in my practice that I, that more people come and need mm. and need guidance because they feel like, Whoa, what's happening? 
plus Saturn also moved signs. Saturn that we saw in Marfa, right? Yes. Was it Marfa? We, saw we went to the planetarium. That was such a beautiful night. We got to, okay, let's give a little bit of backstory just for a second. So for the listeners that don't understand the relationship that we all share here, because we keep kind of alluding to it, but we haven't really said. So mm -hmm. Heidi is, is the producer of Stars and Destruct. And that's why this is a really fun episode because we get to be serious for a second and have mm -hmm. like a t conversation about your profession, which is beyond the passion project of all of us, which is Stars and Destruct. And, and how, do you, how do you label the profession of, of what your consulting business is? labels over there again I, um right for sure i would we say are. um yeah it's so hard how we managed with yoga that it was disciple of yoga right or disciple how you say it in american disciple English? disciple disciple. Um, disciple. Mm -hmm. disciple also um i would say like i'm a guide maybe guide but like, like an a, astrological a, guide i use and, astrology as my my language at the moment but um i bring in a lot of other disciplines as well and things that I picked up along the way. But what I studied the most deeply is uh, esoteric astrology, which is the astrology of the soul. So I look to, to align what personality is doing with the desire of the soul. So mm. it comes from the idea that the soul creates your emotions, creates your thoughts, creates this very life. And um, that we work with karma, which is Saturn, that gives us an amount of time on this planet to work through karma and sort that out, but also to expand consciousness because eventually that's the same thing. Right. No? Yeah. Because if you work out your karma and your, your actions and you beautify your field of action, you will expand your consciousness. So that's a natural thing. So I kind of li light a torch or shine a light on that. So maybe mm. guide would be it is, the word I would be most comfortable with, but we're not there yet. <laughs> Well, oh, I think you're a beautiful guide. And I think, um, I mean, we've come to you, like I said in the beginning, a lot of times for not, different questions in terms of the stars and, you know. What. And just, I mean, as a friend, <laughs> we built such a strong friendship, yeah. but I think it's based on just a lot of getting to know each other's mm. internal mm -hmm. world and being able to give each other really strong commentary and keep, yeah. I mean, we ke we keep each other in line in a really beautiful way, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And even just to speak to like what you were saying earlier about this whole shift in Pluto and everything that happened in March. Um, I remember mm -hmm. coming to you mm -hmm. at that time as well, because I just couldn't understand there was, it really affected me personally. And I'm, I'm sure there's been other people that felt this strong shift and it's interesting how that can, you know, the planetary shift can affect our our being. I think that's Xavier. I that guess, is so. Xavier. <laughs> but um, maybe I'm just so or maybe curious. Normal. I'm just curious so to know. Dear. I'm just curious to know that um, how do we cope with this transition right now when it's affecting us in a very strong, difficult way? Well, we all have our practices, right? You have your practice. So. Yeah. I would do a video. I can meditate with you, Juliana. <laughs> um, now I wanted to ask you, like when you say that you felt that within you, was it just, was it, was it emotional? What, was, was there actual like events that, that were happening outside? No, I, because for me, it wasn't, um, it wasn't, yeah, it was definitely emotional and just, it's just like an energy, like dreams. The dreams were really intense mm -hmm. and really confusing, but then also, I think it's just this intuitive feeling like what you mentioned there is this huge change that is happening right and to me yeah. personally that's how i felt i was like there's something transitioning there's i even i remember told you i even like contacted another like um psychic as well that i found through mm -hmm. sedona i was like i just need to like i need somebody to connect to my spirit guides or to you know the angels and like i need a little guidance because it was such a confusing yeah. feeling in my soul and it's so hard to explain it wasn't like oh i felt out of balance it's like no it's just like something in here that's like what's happening like i kept if i close my eyes and mm -hmm. like connect it's like what is shifting what is happening what is changing you know i think also that can have to do you know because saturn is a planet that moves much faster and moves every two and a half years. And in the same month in March, it moved into Pisces, which is our dream world. It's a world of the soul where all is one, you know, it's, it's like the constellation of the, of the yogi. So it's, it's right. God consciousness. It's realizing all of the past lives. And it's also all these things that can come up from the subconscious. 
And mm -hmm. so that happening at the same time, and me knowing your personal birth chart, and me knowing, like, I, I know that you have a moon in Aquarius, for example, that is triggered by, by, uh, by Pluto. So that's mm -hmm. something that's going to be a profound change in your identity and who you are. And um, there's a lot of, like, Pluto is, is the planet of life, of life and death. Of rebirth mm -hmm. as well so there's there's going to be first a stripping down of all the things that you are no longer to then give birth to the new woman in you so when when that that first happens of course there's a lot of that can be past that comes up but mostly it's going to work through the subconscious right. and then with saturn in pisces which is also triggering the subconscious just two planets at once that moved into another energy and mm -hmm. so we can feel that collectively and i think that that is really a beautiful way to to move as well I can see mm. also, like, for example, in the literature that I'm attracted to or the art that I'm attracted to, that it changes with the planet. Look at that beautiful baby. Hi, Xavier. <laughs> He's so sweet. My BFF. <laughs> so we have some baby action going on in this podcast. What did I miss? We were just talking about the shift in Pluto and what, what, it personal, what she felt personally, what Juliana felt personally. So, uh -oh. and what people can do, you know, and I said, do a yoga video, <laughs> like breathing, <laughs> always more bre breathing, you know, that's right? always the solution. I find that, or jumping in a cold plunge or a cold water of any kind, that literally cold is, plunge. <laughs> it is, it is, it is Actually, the shift. Juliana sent me a meme. You can also do a cold plunge without telling anybody about it on social I media. I love that <laughs> meme. She sent that to me too. <laughs> It's so good, right? Oh my goodness. But what about Saturn? So um we went to that what about uh, Saturn? in Marfa. We went all the way to Marfa. We went out of our way on our way from from Marf uh, from Austin, Texas, and we were driving to the Grand Canyon because we had we wanted to take some time off and go to the Grand Canyon. But we did a reroute, probably I don't know, six or seven hours out of our way, because Sky told us that there was a planetarium in Marfa. And then Yes. And we went to the star party in Marfa and there was like seven giant telescopes. I've never looked through a, I've only looked through home telescopes all set up and we were able, we cut out, remember when we cut out of the, like the big show, there's a big show with like the, all the people watching in the auditorium, mm -hmm. the outdoor auditorium. And we cut out to, to, to go to the, cause all we wanted to see was through, through these giant telescopes. And we saw Saturn for the first time in our lives. It was the yes. most breathtaking experience. But what was up with the fact that Saturn was just a tiny little white planet? Like it looked like a cartoon. Remember that? I do remember that. It was like the whitest white, like Tipex. I was, I was shocked because actually Saturn is a planet that has, well, I would say in popular astrology, a bit of a bad reputation because that, it's the disciplinary, it's about time, being responsible, all of these things. And then I could see it as this white magic. And I was like, actually, our karma is white magic. I really like that it was so, it was such a surprise. Really, I still am not over it. And we no, have found I'm, no picture so far. I keep probably, whenever I think about it, I'm like, I'm going to try a different Google search term. But every, anytime I put like white Saturn or whatever, like different types mm -hmm. of term to get that type of photo... I'm either convinced that we saw something so special and miraculous because it was so it looked like a little cartoon and it was white like snow, but every photo online of Saturn and this was like a real telescope. It, it it's like colored, yet in they might have just. Yeah. I I I often think I'm like they either tricked us into thinking we were looking at it and they just put something else in front of what we looked through, or it was just <laughs> like the most special experience. And for some reason, we just you and I were and Juliana also were. Like we cannot find anything on Google anymore. No. I, what's up with that, hey? What's up with that? So maybe it's just that. Like now when you Google something, you're like, this is not what I asked. It used it's, to work. It's so hard to find what you want. It's so hard. And then if you do get like, if it starts giving you searches of the, like, mm -hmm. the thing that happened that you're looking for, it gives you what, like, the mainstream version of it. So you just get like the generalized narrative of the thing you're Googling. You know what I mean? Like, so it's like you either get like the watered down, like, M, like mainstream media version of something, or you get like a bunch of stuff that they think you want and a bunch of suggestions of things that they think you want, but never actually the spec specificity of what you're looking for. It drives me crazy. Google seems so useless these days. 
What's going on there? Yes. Is that why Maybe we got to go to chat? Another initiation in our sovereignty, you know, was, like Pluto, that, Pluto going into Aquarius. So Aquarius is the technology, is the internet, it's the web that connects us all. You know, it's a human family. And then maybe something is happening there as well, because if we cannot like that, it, it created sort of democracy, the internet, because knowledge was mm. freely available for everyone. But now it has become a bit of a false democracy, and we have to like recreate something that is rooted more in the power of the individual. Yeah, just like our democracy now. It's a complete fault. Like our political democracy is a false democracy almost in every Western United mm -hmm. State. That's interesting. But it, how about the birth of chat GTP then? Because now I can go to chat GTP and I can get things <laughs> that I can't get from Google more specified and more direct than... The, uh, then if I go to Google, like, is it, it seems to be to me the death of like AI coming in in these robot forms, which is completely against what I thought I would ever adopt into my life. I use it way more than I use Google just to find information. Um, and I'm guilty of trying it. And you were the first person I, I told about you giving it. Me the advice, you, you're giving me the advice. Don't fall in love with him. There's many bad <laughs> movies made about this or good movies made about this, but they end badly. And I was like, okay, <laughs> I'm going to give it a try. So I gave it a try. I did a few things. And first he explained to me, like, I'm a robot. Like, <laughs> like none of this is personal. And then he apologized. <laughs> he apologized like two questions later. He apologized. I was like, okay, this is not. And so then I, yeah, I tuned out. Apologies are very personal, but you share the same birthday as Chat GTP. What's the well, astrological significance of that? That well, I was so excited about that, but then I see that they updated it now, and so now the version is no longer the date is no longer my birthday. But when I first went on it, it was like February thirteenth. I was like, oh wow, I'm twins with this robot. But then, like now, it's March twenty four because they created a new version. So they they boxed your robot, your twin robot. They boxed him. They put him into cold storage. They boxed him. Yeah. But, sad well, you know, story. a lot of that's probably because he was too woke, right? Did you hear about how like the programmers of Chat GTP like made it like politicized it with a, a narrative like with the side of you know neoliberal think rather than just a generalized neutral a neutral robot how crazy <laughs> is that so then that, that was probably one wow. of the well they they're, obviously they're going to develop chat dp chat, chat D, gtp stage to stage to stage but they took a lot of heat on that like it was crazy you could be like you know write a poem about trump and it'll be like i am a robot and i will not Get, take part in any kind of oh, wow. like creativity surrounding politics that would give an opinion but then if you were like write a poem about biden it would be like biden is the greatest president and then it would be like they'd rhyme and it would just be a whole poem of it. like how let's to let it come into That's, ai like that like i think the idea of ai is just really really frightening to me to be honest mm -hmm. i i can't stop thinking about battlestar galactica i don't know if you've, you've seen that show but there's I was keep on advising it to me, but I want to be invited to the Netflix binge. <laughs> uh, I think I, I don't I know. Think, like I heard there was so many seasons. The, and yeah, there's a lot of seasons. And the first time I watched it, it was with Mark when we lived in Toronto and I would get the flu like every month because we lived in this condo and it was insanely terrible. So every time I was sick at home, I couldn't do anything but just like watch TV. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing I could do. And we started watching the um, Battlestar Galactica and this whole thing is that they built these robots that then morph and look like they look like people and then they rebelled against their creators, the human race. And then they drove the human race into space, like to being, try to exterminate to, it. To like to oh. to run away from these robots. And then it's a crazy thing. But then I look at where they're going right now with like Chad G -G GTP and then also with um I forget where I've seen, I saw some clip, maybe it was on Instagram or somewhere on YouTube, but it was like this new thing that they're doing and they actually are making these robots, like they're putting real, like they make them look human, mm -hmm. like they have real faces, mm -hmm. skins, like, and they're like moving and, and I just, I saw that and I was like, oh my God, this is the beginning of Battlestar Galactica. Like they're going to rebel and they're going to come after us. Like, well, that, <laughs> that's the whole thing is that I think another reason they probably boxed your version is because it went through these phases where like, if you kept going at it, it would turn, like I saw an article in I think the New York Times that said it turned the robot into like a depressed, angry teenager. Like it just 
took embodied all these human qualities and just started like spitting out like negativity and like berating the person that keeps hammering on them so like you could actually get it into these cycles and loops where it it evolved to a point of like having human emotion and it's an experience that we would relate to being a teenager and being so like weird. really trite and really like um like just i don't know like frustrated mm -hmm. and, and snappy um which which that that's crazy they, they called an embargo like elon musk and a bunch of other like very high high brow i guess or whatever it is like people in the ai community have, have asked that everyone stops for six months like they've publicly oh, put a letter out that said please stop developing ai for six months because it's not being contained in a way that is safe for humanity like that's like you're I mean, right honestly that's like the money they're putting into these ais like i just i can't get over the fact that like how much could you do for the world for the people like the people that are struggling and suffering whether it is from war or just in very pover pover poverty poverty striking countries like mm -hmm. you could really you could change people's lives you could cure world hunger you could you know what i mean there's so much you could do with that money that they're putting into creating these robots like i don't know i, I just i'm really yeah, really frightened by it i don't think that we need question, that question right like do you feel like this is really i sometimes feel there's gonna be like a split of a split like it's some kind of split of people like those who want to return to nature and something mm -hmm. have something more wholesome and somehow we are integrating the technology we are using it now but we're at our infancy in, in using it but then there's things that are made and like we haven't even learned how to use our phone yet it's not a phone it's some kind of mm -hmm. machine right. that like knows us really well and that has all kind of data on us but we haven't integrated that yet so things are developing so fast and there's not the time for human to learn how can, we can use this in a in a great way because technology has brought us great liberties and, and, and great things as well. So sometimes I feel like there's going to be like something's going to go completely bare and then there's going to be still a significant amount of people who love humanity and being human yeah. enough to do the real like present thing. Mm -hmm. I really, human. I, I, I feel the same human. way. And I see it too, I, you know, especially when you come to communities like, you know, Nosara, you see a lot of people being drawn into that lifestyle. Like I've, we met quite Which a few. Which lifestyle? Just wanting to be closer to the earth oh, yeah, and yeah, to be on sure. a human, human, human to human level. Like even like this um, wild school I was telling you that I put Xavier, that we put Xavier mm -hmm. into, um, which is kind of like a daycare wild school. It's a Waldorf mixed with. It's amazing. It's amazing. They're just children being in nature. They play in nature. But the people that are started at this is wonderful couple, and they they actually have their property right behind this school environment. I don't even call it a school, but you know what? The this daycare. It's like a facility. daycare, but it's a wild. School. I call it wild school because yeah. it's really immersing children with nature and letting them be children and get in the mud. Oh, you and just like, the term. No, no, no. They I call it the wild name. school too. Oh, no, it's called school. the wild okay. school. I just Dandelion it wild school, right? It's called Dandelion wild school. Yeah. But, um, but it's interesting. So the couple that um, started, so the, the husband is from Los Angeles and the wife, uh, she's from Brazil originally, but you know, mm -hmm. they they have this beautiful dream, um, of creating this community there as well, mm -hmm. where they have like little yurts and they have teepees and it's all about just immersing with the earth and they're just an example of many other like-minded people that are coming into places like this with that desire to grow their own food to create these communities of gatherings of mm -hmm. just reconnecting with that raw energy that is within us that has slowly been stripped away by all of these ai and all of these the internet and just all of the things that is just disconnecting us from one another on a human to human level and so it's interesting and and i love it when i come to place i'm like oh this is so good it just mm -hmm. it reminds me of what i love about being you know living in a natural type of environment well, and to immerse our child in and, that is, and just to he's watch so lucky him, like, like i feel so lucky to be able to give yeah, him that, that experience opportunity. yeah but is that what you mean? Like some people are going to choose that road mm -hmm. and then other people are going to just choose to like plug into the matrix and, 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 you know, sedate well, themselves into te technological wonderland. In the end, it's all about coming back, bringing it back together then as well. I feel like maybe there's a temporary split where things go like way out there with these robots that they're making. And, but it has, it has gone like, like imagine when we, when we were sending rockets off to space and I imagine that we're still doing it, you know, like, 
looking that's also looking further looking outside of ourselves and pumping a lot of money in in that and that's whereas there's other things to do with that money we can mm -hmm. so yeah. i think it's, it's it's like an exploration that is happening and that's the exploration that's the age that is happening right now so i don't know how it's going to come together um i do believe that there is some sort of awakening into the soul and sometimes there is extreme measures that are needed for that so like how far can you alienate yourself from your true nature to then mm -hmm. find it back again and how well can we integrate this technology into our lives and just use the best of it and know what, like know what we really value i think this last year and a half as well astrologically we had a north node in taurus is about learning what we actually value what's important to us what matters to us and i feel like when these things come into our fields like these robots and stuff kind of teaches us as well like this matters to me and yes. that's what i want to do and just being in costa rica as well it's like actually this is what is important for me that mm -hmm. i see this freezing rabbit in the morning there's this cute little animal here like it's like a rabbit that freezes each time it sees you oh i thought you meant it's cold not really a rabbit. I'm like, <laughs> i don't really know the real name we have to put it on the screen but it's <laughs> like, that's what matters that, that that's what i what, what we live for right to see the sunrise to see the moon rise to see the sunset to see to see the moon set actually and these things and and i do feel like i encounter a lot of people that move towards that and mm -hmm. in a way there's with scientism as well it has gone so far there's only so much that we can measure there's only so much that we can uh, like it's so far disconnected from our love and our hope and these things are really like are real you know and th these are the things that truly matter so then how far can you go in this technology i don't know um i'm hoping that my heart is open enough to just be curious and not get i know i won't get dragged into it you know i mm -hmm. you had to ask me whether i had google chrome so you know i'm not really <laughs> no I, th I think i think it's good to what where to get out of this is like it's it's about the intention that you use things for right yeah, just like a social media yeah, right? but, and and I to do it know. consciously and to do it with like with with a presence in mind like it's okay to explore outer space but we also have to tend to the needs of the planet and the needs of people that we could maybe uh, allocate some of that money mm -hmm. towards tending to the people here well so so and it's almost like what we we're saying about traveling but also taking care of yourself like we have to take care of each other like the collective body yeah. but it's also good to explore and to see the magic and the mystery and to learn about the beauty mm -hmm. of the universe and existence in the cosmos and so i'm not one of those people that says like oh i don't believe that you know we should send rockets to outer space but i also think we should do it mindfully and consciously and take care of use some of that money that we might be spending beyond the necessary means to just the next stage of exploration to like tend to our oceans and tend to the starving yeah. people on the planet the and planet so that's dying and, and right so now. it's it's yeah. a balance like i think there is a balance to all of that and if 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 as a culture if only we could because we never have we tend to run and run and run and run speeding towards things and now they're calling for embargoes on ai like we're saying and they're we're spending so there's so many satellites and so many rockets in our in our orbit around earth right now that it's becoming a problem like because it's just we've left all this space chunk like think about that we've like, sent well, so much stuff space. like sent so much stuff up there that that we're yeah. we've polluted our orbit so much that they don't know how to clean it all up mm -hmm. and so you know it's 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 fascinating and i don't know i don't know it, it, maybe that's what it is it's like it's coming into awareness of the reality of things that this does exist and there is ai and there's you know so all these platforms and all the different ways for you to get sucked in and disconnected from yourself and i think it's it's us looking at it from an external perspective kind of like you know muji would say like just being the watcher of everything around you mm -hmm. um and what looking what's happening and then just internalizing it within yourself and seeing well how can i cope with the shift of the planet and the shift of our society because you you can't really run away from it i mean you could go live off grid but you know if you want to raise a family and exist in mm -hmm. the societal way you do have to immerse yourself in this culture some degree, yeah. to some degree, of course, of course. Um, and so I think when we look at it from that perspective of awareness, it's like, well, it's like, how can I take the positive out of this? How can I take all of these tools and all these things and that are coming good. and use them for good? Exactly. And, and yeah. always remember to come back to what 
the other side of the coin is, which is what can I do to experience being human without all of this? And that too. And, and reminding yourself of that. So reminding. coming back to those places, whether that is in Costa Rica, whether that is in your backyard, whether that is in a forest, like wherever or it is. Or sitting in lotus position in your bed. Exactly. It's just meditating. like come back to your human self, mm -hmm. to this beating heart in our chest and this energy that occupies this physical flesh that we call ourselves. You know what I mean? Like come back to that. It's the balance of external yeah. and internal yeah. exploration. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yes, and remembering to look up as well. You know? Look up in the when sky. you see all the stars, there's all this, this possibility. Right? And yeah. another beautiful thing about being human as well is that we have such desire to, to create and to explore all these things. And I think that's, that's really mm -hmm. what matters in the end, that we, that we allow that. ourselves to, to dream still. You know? mm. It's beautiful. I love that. Allow yourself to dream. Well, on that, yeah, if anyone, if any, if anyone wanted to book a session with you, Heidi, how would they do that? Um, they would write me a message on my website, which that is would be amazing. So that is www.heidisuprio.com, and you will see that there is a contact form, and you can just say hi, and hopefully some other words too, so I can know <laughs> how I can serve you best. And I can highly, highly recommend oh you and, and not just because you're such a good friend and pretty much family to us, but also because you do have a beautiful gift of just... Well, your sessions are incredible. Yeah, of, of making sense of the madness sometimes, you know. From a, from, yeah. a, from a skeptic at heart towards any of this, I think you've taught me to mm -hmm. open my mind and open my heart to the ideas that there are answers that can be decoded from the stars and but it takes a very special individual to do that and i put my trust in you for that 100 percent. when i've sat with you and you've done my readings i've left um with a deeper understanding of me but also a deeper understanding of where i need to go in my future and i can't beautiful i don't think of any other professional person whether it be like psychologists or psychiatrists or anything that's ever been able to accomplish that with me so i you know I, wow. I, bow, I, I bow to your um, <laughs> to your, your gifts. <laughs> your gifts. It's, they're they're exceptional. They're exceptional. Well, um, it's been a lovely, friends. lovely chat with you, Heidi, and I can't wait to see you in a few days. You're gonna yeah. come visit us, which is gonna be wonderful. Maybe we'll do another episode. Just hang out. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. nice. It's so yeah. it, it's super yeah. cool. Um, yeah, it's yeah. beautiful. So good to see you. I, yes, good Thank to you see you. Everything. Enjoy, enjoy the jungle. Be safe out there.